The global mining industry continues to face unprecedented change. The demand for critical metals continues uh, to surge. We, so we shift into carbon neutral, uh, but operating environments face a long list of challenges. Interest rates are going up. Uh, we've got the threat of recession. We've just been hearing from the IMF suggesting that a third of the globe will go into recession in 2023. How long that lasts, how deep it is remains to be seen, but certainly that could put a break on demand. But the big demand center of the last 10 years, China also still very much in the shadows because of its COVID policy, which we've yet to see any firm evidence that it wants to move away from, although suggestions are that the authorities there are looking at ways of getting people uh, back to work. So what's all this mean for the global mining sector in 2023? Our regular guest is John Mayer from SP Angel. And uh, John, first of all, I want to say a very happy new year to you. Uh, what about the new year? Um, what's it going to bring for us that look at these markets as an opportunity to make money? Well, the first trading day back is always a, a tough one for forecasts. What we generally get is a fairly strong start to the year uh, across many commodities. And we're seeing that in copper today uh, and gold as well, in fact. So, so that is, is, is as normal. We're expecting a fairly volatile uh, month two months probably. We've spent a lot of time in recent years focusing on China and the growth going on there. And yes, China is, is although it's gone X growth uh, in manufacturing terms, it, it can recover growth in other areas. Um, and it's worth focusing on where this growth is going to come from going forward. And I think the US is going to be going to become much more important to us through this year. Biden's managed to get through a, a bipartisan um, uh, bill. I think it's $1.7 trillion. So there's, there's a lot of cash going into supporting the underlying US economy. There's a lot of money going into developing grid infrastructure, new electrical power infrastructure, all that sort of stuff. And let's not forget electric vehicles within the mix there, just one of many elements. Um, as China slows, a lot of manufacturing has moved outside, has moved offshore China back into the United States for a number of reasons. Uh, the, the, new leg the new restrictions on semiconductor sales to anyone who's got any connection with the People's Liberation Army of China uh, is, is critical here. But of course, that, that move offshore out of China uh, had started anyway because China's zero COVID policy was creating all sorts of problems for Western manufacturers with workers being locked into factories for months on end uh, that was potentially uh, impacting their, um, their, their their rights uh, so that manufacturing was also moving into not just the us but other parts of asia so these other areas are starting to benefit from from china's losses now one of the problems that china's had in recent years is well, one of the, the big issues was it said it was going to develop this dual circulation policy which really means just stimulating local consumption. So it's stimulating people to buy local apartments and houses and stuff like that, and then fitting those apartments with, with white goods, uh, with all the things that people normally buy. But China, of course, had, had held back on that policy. It wasn't helping to enrich the middle class and, and, and the, you know, the population as a whole. Uh, the guys at the top were really just looking after themselves, sadly. So I think we're now going to see President Xi bring in dual circulation, and that will drive Chinese demand. Okay, John, I want to pick up on that point about uh, the markets and where things are moving and bring up an index, the FTSE 350 uh, Mining Index. Uh, we can see on the far left-hand side here, we see these COVID lows back at 11,080. And significantly, in the last few days, we've just begun to trade above that again after the recent lows that we had taking us down uh, to the lows uh, not seen in several years back in July last year, then has come this bounce. And of course, you've got this Ukraine invasion point here at 18,840, where we saw this precipitous drop uh, for the index down into those recent lows. Now, I want to focus on that right-hand side of the chart here, because significantly, I think this is for technical analysts particularly, but I think this backs up the point that we've got new higher highs coming at some point later on this year. We've seen this move for the green line over the red line. Now, these are my two uh, major moving averages, the 50 period moving average, which is the green line, um, moving above the red line, which is a 200 period moving average. Now, this is a golden cross. Now, last time we had um, 
a, a, a golden uh, death cross uh, was back here in August 2021. We saw these declines come through. And we talk a little bit about the volatility we're expecting. That's exactly what we got there before the big declines coming through. So I'm looking for higher highs, possibly later on in the year. And I think if we get past this 11,916, uh, we will then uh, move up from this point. But I think my question to you, John, is what is it that's going to move that market higher? Well, some of the stocks in this index got hammered by the situation in Ukraine. And, and uh, you know, one understands that, that fund managers want to uh, reduce risk within their portfolios. So um, they, clearly the Ukrainian situation created a, a massive problem for European manufacturing, which, which was dep largely dependent on, on Russian gas. Now that Germany and France have, have moved a long, long way away down the track from getting away from Russian gas, they, they having moved into using gas in recent years, they've now moved back into using uh, liquid national, natural gas, which is coming into Germany, and diesel fuel. Um, of course, there's still some exposure to Russia there, but thankfully, uh, oil prices have come down. Brent oil is at $45, sorry, $85 today. So we're a long way off the 120, 130 that we were looking at six months ago. Um, that helps reduce inflation. The ECB, the European Central Bank, is unlikely to raise rates very far in this environment. So I think Europe is still going to focus on trying to uh, reduce the impact of the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, sadly, both sides are throwing a lot of metal at each other, which is, which is never a good thing. Um, but both sides... The West and Russia are, are increasingly gearing up to produce more and more uh, armaments. Um, that will it, that will create cer a certain amount of demand. But for me, the the bigger amounts of demand are going to be the reconstruction of U.S. infrastructure, uh, not just the U.S. grid, which is very important, but other parts of U.S. infrastructure which have been neglected for many many years, and also the the development of dual circulation in China. So. The thing we have to watch out for right now, and the reason why we're all a bit uncertain about where the world is going, is because China has decided to throw open the floodgates, that everybody in China should catch COVID immediately, that they will hide the statistics on how many people are actually dying from it. But this COVID surge is going to disrupt the Chinese economy quite a lot, at least until the end of the Lunar New Year. So what are we talking, the 6th or 7th of February? Uh, and then we, you know, at that point, we need to see, well, how's China doing here? Have, has the nation, all, have they all had COVID? Have they got over it now? Uh, or are they going to see ongoing disruption for another three or six months after that? I think either way, China is going to carry on stimulating its property sector. We're already seeing that and stimulating the dual circulation policy to encourage local people to buy Chinese goods that are not being bought by Western man by Western retailers. So the West has slowed down a lot of its purchases for China. That's caused factories to close. Uh, things like uh, you know a lot of furniture, that sort of stuff, um, because inventories have built up a bit too high over here and demand had also fallen away. But I think a lot of this, where where metals are concerned, when you think of fridges, freezers, air conditioning units, are a big consumer of copper, for example. I think the demand will still be there. And on top of that, we're going to see more and more electric vehicles. Uh, it's not just Tesla anymore. I see that BYD, where Warren Buffett invests and holds about 20%, they're actually producing more electric vehicles than Tesla now. So you've got a, a number of big players in this market all vying for to, to own the, the electric vehicle space going forwards and, and all consuming huge amounts of metal. Just one final question, if I can. It stizzes away a little bit from mainline mining, but it just talks about London as the the home market, if you like, for for, for capital for this particular sector. Because I mean, we've been in, the, uh, in, in this in this job what thirty odd years or so, and, and we know London as as the centre of the world. Uh, mining companies come to London to raise money. They come to London to list. London has benefited from these mining companies on the on the main indices. Do you see London continuing that role as one of the pivotal markets for this sector? Or do you think like we're now hearing within the finance sector that it's beginning to drift away offshore for whatever reason, to whatever other uh, jurisdiction, um, be it Brexit or be it a sluggish economy, 
or other factors that might add up to a negativity for some companies wanting to list here. Do you see London continuing to hold the flag for global mining? Uh, absolutely. I, d I don't see Brexit as an issue for this. Uh, capital flows to wherever it, it, it can be most efficiently put to work. Uh, London is still a huge centre for that. There's a lot of uh, mining project finance expertise in London, and the companies are going to want to be close to that. So, uh, yes, this is, this is very much a global centre. It's, it's much more so than many other parts of the world. It ranks alongside Australia, which has been doing well, and, and Canada, which has a strong uh, mining tradition, um, but still very, it, it, it's seen as, as very much a growth market for mining companies to incubate in and to, and, and to then move further up the value chain. John, we'll have to leave it there, but thanks indeed uh, for your outlook for 2023. Thank you, Jeremy. John Mayer there from SP Angel with his outlook for the mining sector as we see things develop at the beginning of this new year.